Welcome back to the county seat. Our topic today for our roundtable is the uh, desirability and prospects of wilderness as an economic tool for the future for the state of Utah. Well, that's a nice title, isn't it? So uh, we've been having a discussion so far about uh, an, an editorial by the Tribune and their point of view, and uh, we'd be getting a county perspective and, and a, a legal perspective. Mark, uh, when we left this break, I, I, I saw you rolling around a thought in your head. Sure. Um, yeah, Congress is the landlord of the federal lands. Mm -hmm. But Congress itself passed federal law in 1976 and other places where Congress said, BLM and Forest Service, make your plans, make your management plans consistent with state and local land use plans to the maximum extent consistent with federal law. So this idea that we should all just, you know, walk away and, and not worry about this because it's the federal land and the state and counties have no business uh, worrying about what the feds do is just contrary to law because Congress itself said we're going to make the state and the counties significant partners and players. They have cooperating agency status and BLM and Forest Service, like I said, they are charged to make sure that their plans are consistent with state and local plans. Now, state and local, what are state and local plans? State, the, the legislature and county commissioners across the state have made it clear that they are not in, the, they are not in favor of this broad brushed uh, designation of wilderness on the order of nine million acres or more. Uh, individual counties across the state are in favor of some wilderness designations, but they'd like to do it based on a collaboration within that county with all stakeholders there. And they're not going to come anywhere close, Chad, to the numbers that are being bandied around by Eastern congressmen with their perennial bills, they call Red Rock Wilderness Bills, that get perennially introduced and perennially, perennially rejected. So that kind of model is contrary to uh, what Congress envisioned for state and local partic participation. And I don't think anybody's arguing that state and local government should just be ignored. I think everybody points to what happened down around St. George where they had their envision process and they worked out and they said, and with the federal government and the local officials together saying, this is good for wilderness, this isn't, let's, let's work it out and put it together. And I don't, I don't disagree that you will have uh, elements that want to paint a whole broad brush and just giant acreage is a wilderness just because it looks cute and uh, but they're they're feeling that this is the kind of thing that you need to do to have a negotiating point to start with people who think that if you haven't drilled a hole on it it's worthless and so you have these two things that are pulling it pulling at each other and I mean even farmers get into the track of fall into the trap of referring to their own wheat fields as undeveloped land as if it's not being used for anything mm -hmm. you know wilderness land national park land national monument land is useful for something even if it isn't being dug up. Well isn't, isn't there Clara, a difference between federally designated lands like a, like, like a park or, or a forest or something and, and undesignated oh, lands? Oh certainly. There's no, it, no development at all allowed on a national park and, and also na national recreation areas, national monuments. That's ended when those are designated. Most of that was undesignated federal land, most of your county, and with the Grand Staircase, it's, it flip-flopped and most of your county became designated land. Uh, how has that impact had an effect on you? See, with the designation of the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, that added another 800,000 acres, uh, in fact, de facto wilderness, and just by the designation of the monument itself. And Chad, <coughs> um, when you say the Grand Staircase Monument, that is the anti-model. That is the model of zero collaboration, zero input from state and local governments. That monument to what, Claire, two plus million acres? 1.9. 1.9 .9 was, was just announced by surprise. It, it took state and local leaders completely off guard. There was zero collaboration, zero input at the local level. And uh, there was a, a coal mine online ready to go that was shelved. Um, so that, that is not, that monument is, is not the model of how it should go. I appreciate George referring to the uh, Washington, Washington County Land Bill, but you take that, you compare it to the monument, they're 180 degree polar opposites in terms of local cooperation, local input. Claire? I'd like to make a statement on, uh, on uh, advocates for uh, for more wilderness. 
what the, the advocates for wilderness don't do, they don't tell you what they, you can't do in wilderness. They tell you what you can do, but you never, you never hear what you can't do. I, I watched uh, on this program, what was it, a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and their old friend Brad Barber was telling about his skiing on the, on, in wilderness and all the good extolling the great things he could do. Well, I'd like to roll that, uh, that thing forward 15 years and then ask Brad how many things he could do on the monument then. He couldn't get on the monument with a wheelchair. Wheels are not allowed on, uh, I shouldn't say monuments, I should say wilderness. You can't take a, a wheelchair on a, in wilderness. You can't uh, take a chainsaw in wilderness to fight a forest fire. You can't uh, ride a mountain bike in wilderness. Those are some of the things you can't do. Uh, so the elderly people, those people that can't hike or ride a horse or something such as that to get into the wilderness, the, this wilderness is tied up permanently to, to that group of people. Well, George, I, I want to give you a chance to a answer, and, and so I'm going to give you the top of the next block okay. to respond to that. We have to take a commercial break. We'll be right back here on the county seat. Almost 45% of the oil produced in Utah, 7.8 million barrels, comes from Duchesne County. That oil feeds our state economy, provides job growth, and supports local business. Here in Duchesne County, we're working to make Utah an economic, cultural, and technological leader. Whether you're here for business or pleasure, Duchesne County will welcome you with open arms and invite you to explore all the beauty of the Uinta Mountains. Duchesne County, close enough for business, far enough to get away. Picture yourself in Logan, Utah. We do winter right. What do you picture when you hear Rich County, Utah? Bear Lake Adventure? Snowmobile action? Pristine skiing? Spectacular solitude? Well, if that isn't what first came to mind, then you just don't know Rich County. The Bear Lake Monster Polar Plunge. Snowmobiling Monte Cristo. Ice fishing Bear Lake. Skiing the backcountry. Fishing at the Cisco Disco. Come and find out what you never knew you were missing. Rich County, Utah. 